The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Uh, all right, so uh, in terms of uh, what we're going to be discussing today, it's various aspects of feed-forward loops. So first of all, uh, we will go over this idea of a network motif in more detail. We talked about it a little bit in the context of auto-regulation. You know, there was a simple argument there that, uh, that auto-regulation is a network motif. And uh, in order to understand how to detect network motifs in general, we have to look uh, at a little bit more detail in terms of these subgraphs and the frequency that they'll appear and so forth. Um, and then uh, after seeing that the feed-forward loop is a network motif, then there's this question, oh, well, what might be the functional significance? And uh, in, in the chapter that you just read, you'll, you found that this so-called coherent type 1 feed-forward loop has a nice attribute that it's a sign-sensitive delay element. Okay. Uh, the incoherent type 1 has this feature that it's a pulse generator. And kind of related to that, it can also speed up the response time. Or, right, so it can uh, make the response time for turning on uh, shorter. Right? So speed up the response rate, if you'd like. Uh, we'll also maybe say a little bit that there's been later work demonstrating that, uh, that the feed the incoherent type 1 can also act as a fold, uh, fold detector. So uh, it can sense changes in the kind of fold, uh, the fold change of concentrations of proteins. And then finally, we'll say something about how you can extend uh, these ideas of network motifs to larger structures, in particular, how you can get uh, useful uh, temporal programs. Okay. All right. So. Uh, we, we, we started out with this network uh, that is kind of our, our, uh, our base network is this transcription uh, network characterized in E. coli. Right? And, and we've already talked about it uh, some. Right? So there's uh, going to be uh, some, uh, some measure of the number of, of nodes and the number of edges. Right? So we have n nodes. We have e edges. And this is from experimental uh, measurements of you know, what is it that regulates what. Okay. Now, uh, from this, we'll, we'll have some set of uh, kind of directed edges, okay, because indeed we know that there's going to be some, uh, some transcription factor that will regulate some other protein. Um, we, what we want to know is, are there patterns that occur more regularly than what you would expect based on chance? Okay. Now, autoregulation, we found, indeed appeared more regularly or more frequently than you would expect by chance. Uh, and there are a limited number of other uh, network motifs that have that property. Right? In particular, we'll, we'll kind of analyze this idea of, um, of, of the feed-forward loop. Okay. Now, there were, uh, our, in, in the network that we kind of talk about a lot, there, around four, there were around 400 uh, genes or proteins and then around 500 uh, observed edges, right? Uh, and this would be inter, you know, interactions or regulation. Uh, regulation. Okay. Now, uh, there's this idea of sparseness. Right. Can somebody remind us maybe what this is supposed to tell us about? Yes. All right, so there's kind of n squared possible edges. Yeah. All right. I mean, if you just connected everything, you'd be connected. And okay. so n is about the order of n to the power of n squared. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Right edges that we, we observe in this real network is, is actually around order n. Okay. All right, so this sparseness, which is also this probability p, if we're going to make a network somehow that has some similar property to the observed network, this is the, there's some probability p that, the, that an actual edge will appear. And this is given by the observed number of edges divided by the total possible number of edges, which is indeed n squared. Okay. What you see is that, at least in this network, uh, this p is much less than 1. Okay. So this is, this is what we mean by sparse. Okay. Now, uh, you can also think about the question of 
how many edges does a typical uh, does a typical gene have? You know, say emanating from it, and well, you can see that it's around one, right? Of course, each edge connects two things, right? So, if you were to say on average each gene has kind of one edge going out and one edge going in, right? Of course, there might be a reason to believe that these averages are not as uh, well, they, they can be misleading. And why, why might the average be misleading? Yes? A right. It's going to be a distribution with heavy tails. And in particular, on which side? So the average will be biased towards the Right. OK. So, right. so the average is always the average. But there, there's going to be some tip. But I guess the question is, there's going to be, there are going to be some proteins or some genes with many of these outgoing edges. Right. And more generally, it, do, you, do you expect that right, there, there's a natural limitation in all this? I mean, it's, we're, part of the value of this approach is that we're abstracting away from a lot of the, the, the microscopic or the biological details. But every now and then, it's good to go in and think about it a little bit. Right? So there's a good reason that you would expect many uh, proteins to not have any outgoing edges. And wh why would that be? Yes? OK, right. So, so there are some proteins that have rather specific functions, you might say. And that, I think that's true. I think that's part of it. But there's maybe something that's maybe even a little bit more general that we, that's worth pointing out here. Yeah? Anything that's not a transcription factor, right? So I mean, you know, we, we say transcription, but we don't never really quite specify. But what it means is it's something that can affect the transcription of other things, right? So it's, it, we're talking about the function of it when we say transcription factor. And just, you know, a majority of the proteins in any genome are not transcription factors. What that means is that they, to first order, cannot, at least directly here, influence the transcription of other, of other genes. Okay? Right? So this is you know, a reflection of, of this power law distribution that we observe. And so, you could argue, oh, well, it's maybe not a surprise that, these th that this outgoing edge distribution is power logs. We know that there are some transcription factors that control many things, and there are many proteins that don't control any other, um, any, the expression or the transcription of any other proteins directly. Right? Okay. All right, but at least it's just useful to think, all right, you know, on out, it's good to know what the properties of this thing are on average, even though for the, for the outgoing edges, the, the average is a little bit dangerous because it's really that. Most proteins don't have any outgoing edges, and then some have many. Right. All right, so this is this probability p, and this is going to be useful because we're going to uh, this this p will kind of appear when we're trying to construct these random networks. Right. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, ask, uh, you know, how how frequently or how many of a given subgraph do you expect to appear in this larger network that we have here? Now, uh, we know that, and we're, and we're going to characterize, characterize each of these subgraphs by kind of two properties. Okay. Right. And, and in particular, what we want to do is we want to, if we're going to analyze some uh, smaller kind of graph, we just have to keep track of how many, um, how many nodes are in the subgraph and how many uh, edges are in the subgraph. All right. So for example, if we have autoregulation, then we're just talking about little n equal to 1, little g equal to 1. right? Whereas in the case of this feed forward loop, uh, what, what is little n and what's little g? Well, uh, you know, we can count now. All right. So here, uh, indeed, n is equal to 3, 1, 2, 3, and g is also equal to 3. And we're going to find that actually the fact that these two numbers are equal uh, is somehow very relevant in, in thinking about the dynamics of these, of these networks later. Uh, in this framework, when I, have an, when I just draw an arrow in the context of a generic subgraph, am I necessarily trying to say that, that this is upregulation of x upregulating y? No. 
Right? So this is uh, a bit confusing because uh, depending on the context, sometimes the arrows actually do mean upregulation. Sometimes they just mean regulate. Right? And in this case, when we're talking about subgraphs, we're just saying that x regulates y in one way or the other. Right? So this is, uh, this is also how we're going to write the so-called coherent type 1 feed-forward loop. But for right now, this is just a generic feed-forward loop. Right. Yes? Upregulate means positive regulation? Yes. Positive yes. Say activate. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the, the way that we, we think about this is we ask, all right, what's the expected number of some subgraph uh, G? Okay. And indeed, what we're going to be doing for right now is assuming this is an erdos Rennie random network. Okay. Now, uh, what we're told is that this is going to look something like the following. Okay. All right. Uh, could, could somebody explain one of, one of these three terms? Yes. Okay. All right. So for here, what we're going to do is we're going to say, all right, we're going to, for example, if, if in this context, we'll say, all right, we're going to choose these three. Okay. Now the question is, we have to put in three edges as well to connect those nodes, right? And each one of them has some probability p of actually somehow appearing, okay? Because this is uh, this is what we're keeping constant from the original network, right? So we're assuming that we have this erdos ready network. We have the same number, say roughly 400 nodes. And then what we're going to do is grab maybe three of them and ask, all right, what's the probability that we get these three actual edges? Right? So you get p to the g. Okay. All right, now wh where does this term kind of come from? Yes? Right, so we're going to be selecting n nodes. We're assuming that this n is much larger. You know, we're assuming that we have a big network, so it's much small or much larger than the, uh, the size of the subgraph we're looking at. So we don't have to think about n times n minus one, n minus two, and so forth, right? Uh, and then, and then there's this there, there's this factor a here as well, which, uh, depending on how you do your counting, uh, it, it this get this is a this is a little bit tricky. But what what was a again? Yes. The number of ways to arrange the edges among the symmetry Yes, yeah, so it's a symmetry factor. It's a way of. Yeah, it's, it, and there, there, I think there are multiple, way, multiple ways of looking at this. I think you could, you could think about it as the number of ways of, of rearranging x, y, and z and having the same, uh, the same subgraph, right? The, the, the exact same one, right? Um, and in this case, there's actually no way to rearrange x, y, and z to ha have the same one, right? Because x is a op occupies a special spot, y is indeed again a special spot, z is special, right? So there's no uh, permutations that you can do to get the same thing, right? Whereas uh, if you have this repressilator, all right? Now, now here I'm I'm just drawing this as an arrow because again we're just thinking about the generic version of these things, all right? So it's just when we have x, y, z regulating each other. All right, in this case, uh, you can get the same network by r rotating the, the, these x, y's, and z's. Right? So in this case, you get a equal to 3. Okay. For pretty much all the conclusions that we're going to be talking about, these factors of 1, 2, 3 don't actually end up being relevant. But it's good to know that they uh, indeed exist. Okay. All right, so this is, uh, this is, this is fine. Uh, but it's, it's useful to, uh, to express this in, um, in another way. Right. In particular, we can, uh, we can always define this lambda, which is e over n. Right. That's the mean number of incoming edges or the mean number of outgoing edges. Right. And, uh, and with this, we can, we can express this this guy in, in a way that is, is surpri you know, surprisingly informative. Right? Okay. 
Okay, so this is, uh, this is really, I mean, nothing happened except that we just can't plug this thing in here. Right, but by doing so, we, we see something that's kind of interesting, which is that there's reason to believe that for many of these networks, this lambda, which this mean number of uh, incoming edges, that lambda will be roughly similar, whether you're talking about a network that is uh, 500 nodes large or 5,000 nodes large. Right? So this lambda is, and indeed, in this case, it's around 1. Right? It's around just over 1. Okay. Right? So that means that when we think about the number of subgraphs that will be in this large network, right, it scales with the size of the, of the overall network with this little n minus little g. Okay. Now, and in particular, in cases when you have the same, you're, you're analyzing a subgraph with the same number of nodes as, as edges, then you just get n to the 0, and it doesn't scale with the number. So for those, and indeed for basically all those subgraphs where little n is equal to little g, then you, you expect of order 1 of those. You know, for, if, if lambda is around 1, then you expect of order 1 of those to appear in the network. Right? And, and you know, so from a very kind of simple standpoint, the networks, like the feed-forward loop that we see that is a network motif, what the expectation is that in a random network you'd get around 1, maybe 2. Whereas if you see many of them, you know, dozens, then it's indeed a network motif. Right? Okay. Are, there, are there any questions about how that appeared in, in the chapter, or the argument there? Okay, so indeed, we can, uh, we can actually just then say for, for the feed forward loop, we can just go ahead and ask how many are, were observed in E. coli, the, this, this, this network that was actually observed. All right. And this was 42, I believe. All right. Whereas if you do this analysis for the Erdos Reni random network, you get uh, 1.7 kind of plus or minus 1.3. Because these things, they appear kind of randomly, so they should be Poisson distributed. Uh, all right, so you, expir you, you expect of order one of them to appear in a random network with this same kind of sparse, the same number of edges. But we actually observe this much larger number, so then you can say, all right, this, uh, this is evidence for uh, the feed forward loop being, uh, being a, a network motif, right? That, that for some reason, this subgraph appears more frequently than what you would expect uh, based on chance. Okay. Of course, then you know, we, we alluded to this on the, at the end of class on Tuesday that maybe this erdos reni network is not the proper null model or null network to be using. Right? And maybe we should be using one of these degree-preserving networks. Uh, all right, so maybe we should try to preserve more of the properties of the original network. Right? And what, what is the... What's the property that, that we would, we, well, yeah, so what is it that, you know, can somebody you know, say a little, bit, a little bit, what do we mean by degree preserving? Because right, there's, there's an element that, this, that our null model here already preserves something about the degree, right? right? It preserved the means, right? So it's not just that, it's not that we picked up some random null model, some random ER network, right? So yeah, what, what, what is it that we want to uh, keep, tra uh, keep track of in this degree preserving network that's more? Or maybe, uh, oh, I, yeah, I saw a hand over there, but I don't want to, I'm not trying to call on people randomly, although I, I'm going to start doing that in the second half of the semester, just after drop date. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, right, so we're going to um, preserve not only the mean of the incoming and outgoing edges, but also the actual degree distribution. Right? In a very concrete way, we can actually just say that each node actually does maintain the exact same number of edges, right? right. So in particular, we can say, uh, here we say that all nodes have the same, um, nodes maintain their, their uh, degree distribution, or maintain, uh, I'll say, number of incoming outgoing. Okay. 
right? And, uh, and, and there was a simple algorithm for doing that. Right? If you recall, what you can do is you can just take two edges randomly and just swap the locations. Right? And you do that many, many times, and you end up maintaining uh, the, both the incoming out and the outgoing uh, numbers of, of edges. And uh, if you do this analysis on a degree-preserving random network, well, you get a 7 plus or minus 5. Right. So this makes a big difference. Okay. So if, for example, the experimentally observed network had 10 of these feed-forward loops, then what you'd see is that actually comparing to the Erdos-Reni, you would have said, oh, well, that, that's a network motif. Whereas comparing to this degree-preserving, you would have said it's, uh, it's not. Right. Yes? Yeah, I think it, it's it's close. Is the um, yeah, but I think not. Um, I think it, it ends up not being quite. But I think, um, but it's 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 yeah, but it is close. Yeah. So the um, I think that it is certainly now this this well you'll notice that here there are four hundred genes. How how many genes does E. coli have? Anybody? A few thousand, right? So, so, uh, so the 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 network that that we were analy analyzing that original paper was not the full transcription network of E. coli. No. Is, how, how would people, um, how would you Yeah, well, figuring out any any part of it is actually hard in some ways. Yeah, yeah. yeah so actually, the, in this the way that they actually annotated this particular network, I I uh, I'm not sure. Can so, does any? Uh, I mean, how would you? Yeah, what, what kind of data would you need in order to, uh, to get at this? Does anybody have any? I mean, if I asked you to do this in your lab, what, what would you do? Yes? Maybe you can look at sort of binding strategies and proteins that promote this sequence. Right, so you could actually use a computational program to try to is there, are you, yeah. right, so to actually estimate binding affinities of these proteins to the to the DNA, right? Um, yeah, and, and actually, and, and these days, actually, experimentally, you can actually just measure for the entire uh, proteome, basically, just uh, the um, the affinity of binding to, to different promoters. Of course, that doesn't prove that it's going going to regulate expression, right? Uh, but that that at least points you in in the right direction. Then you can actually, if you want, you can just experimentally go and you know <laughs> put the this protein on an inducible promoter and just see if it does regulate expression, right? Uh, yeah, so actually at this stage, people have, for something like E. coli, we have uh, collections of um, strains where every gene has been removed. Right? Uh, we have collections where every gene has been tagged. Right? And of course, when I say every, this means that it was tried to make it for every. And then, uh, of course, if it's an essential gene, you can't remove it. Uh, if, um, you know, and in some cases, it's hard to put to attach fluorescent protein and so forth, right? But, but there are collections, both for E. coli and for, for, uh, for budding yeast, um, where, where the, this has been done. Um, right. any, other, any other questions about that? Right. Can, can somebody say why it might be that, I mean, <laughs> is this a surprise that, that this number is larger than this number? And in particular, would, um, would the degree-preserving random network have a larger expectation for every subgraph? No. Okay. But in particular, for the feed-forward loop, can, can somebody say why it, we should have expected that the, that the degree-preserving would have a larger number than the OK, so um, I, I, I think that I, I, I think the explanation had the right flavor, but I think there were two, n two inversions in there that kind of like a knot and a knot turned into a, right? I don't know. Um, incidentally, uh, this is a non sequitur, but this happened to me once. The airport, San Francisco, I was going to the airport. I, for, I got the wrong airline in my head. You know, so I thought I was on the wrong airline, so I went to the wrong 
terminal, but then it turned out that I also was wrong about which airline was in which terminal. So then I was actually at the right terminal, even though I just made two mistakes. Um, but you know, you can't count on this happening all the time. So, um, but um, yeah, all right. So, but uh, yeah, so I think, but I think that there were there were there was two things that were mixed up in that explanation. But it, yeah. For transcription factor, it has many outgoing, uh, outcoming edges, and you just have to. Right. Right. So yeah. So it, it's in the, yeah. So there, in the actual network, there are, there are some nodes with many outgoing edges, right? And then what's that's right. You somehow just have to add one more edge. Right. So, because X actually has two outgoing edges. Right. Um, so then, so there's a sense of the feed-forward loop here. What it, you, you can think about X as being some transcription factor, and then what you need is just to f get and there and and X might have many many outgoing edges, right? And so to get a feed-forward loop, what you need is you need for one of those uh, one of those uh, genes that are targeted to just target another one that's in that network, right? So if you have X is regulating, regulating 100, then actually that presents many opportunities to, um, to generate feed forward loops. Yes? Um, at the same time, Z is still just going in. So isn't that the, uh, the completely backwards that we're starting? So that one is more in the backwards? Yeah, this is the problem with verbal arguments, is that you can construct anything. Yeah. Um, and indeed, I would say that uh, this is an example um, what, we, what we said is that the distribution of incoming edges is roughly kind of similar to an ER network in the sense that if, if the mean is one, then you kind of sometimes get zero, sometimes one, sometimes two, and they're all kind of reasonable, right? So in that sense, I'd say this uh, Z uh, node is not so unusual from the standpoint of a degree-preserving network. If Z had a hundred incoming edges, then this then then it's certainly true what you're saying is that uh, that the degree-preserving would then have fewer. All right, so I, I think that th so this is this is the basic argument for why uh, why you might go and look at what the function of a feed forward loop might be. I just want to say a few things that um, about the, this original paper that Uri published. All right, so it's uh, in Science in 2002. Uh, network motifs: colon simple building blocks of complex networks. All right, so uh, so so the authors did indeed analyze both the E. coli and the yeast transcription network, but they also analyzed a number of other networks. Uh, to look at these, these network motifs. So they also analyzed uh, neurons from, um, from C. elegans, the worm, where the connectome has been known for several decades now. And again, they found that feed-forward loops appeared more frequently than what would be expected based on, uh, based on uh, the null model of the degree preserving. Okay? And that, yeah, that's encouraging, is that's saying, oh, maybe feed-forward loops really are somehow preserving some, they're, they're performing some useful uh, information processing task. Um, of course, you know you always have to worry. You know, there's also the spatial arrangement. You know, you can all, you can worry about a lot of things, but it's but that's encouraging. Uh, he also analyzed food webs, where uh, in that case, food feed forward loops were not uh, were not a network motif, but other things were. All right, so that's interesting. Uh, he analyzed uh, the design of um, electronic circuits, a uh, forward logic chip. I don't know what, I don't know what that is, uh, but then also uh, the World Wide Web. It's another network that people love to analyze. And indeed, he saw, uh, saw some other patterns. And, and the idea is that in each of these contexts, the network motifs are different, depending upon the microscopic structure that's leading to it or the function that is being, you know, that's maybe evolving towards or whatnot. Right? So it's a way of getting insight into the, uh, the properties of these complex networks. All right, are there any questions uh, about these network, uh, kind of the global network structures before we get into the feed forward loop in particular? All right, so first I want to just go ahead and, and do a few of our little concept questions just because um, you have the cards. And, you know, and, and I think that the chapter is actually pretty, um, pretty nice in the sense of you can read it and get a, get a clear sense of, uh, of what's going on. Um, but let's, uh, let's start by just considering this feed forward loop, which is this uh, coherent type 1. So now the arrows actually mean activating. Right? So we have x going to y. Um, now it's going to be going to a z. But we have to remember that now that there are two inputs, we do have to specify how the inputs are going to be um, combined. Right? And, and for now, what we'll do is we'll assume that it's an AND gate. 
Okay, and that's, that goes to Z. All right, as always, we're going to have to think, OK, there's some signal x and signal y that come in here. Right? In many, many cases, uh, these transcription factors, in addition to being regulated by another, say, transcription factor, may also be responsive to some signal. Okay? And uh, th there was uh, a nice example of this in, uh, in Uri's book, which was uh, how, how E. coli decide whether to make the suite of uh, proteins that are required to digest the, uh, the carbon source arabinose, the sugar arabinose. Okay, All right. But um, okay. But for now, let's just think about this, and uh, and we want to just make sure that we we remember. And it, and once again, it's not that you should necessarily memorize memorize these things, but after having seen the argument once or twice, you should be able to reconstruct all of these things. Right, so I, I claimed that this is that somewhere in here there's a sign sensitive delay. Okay. All right. Now the question is, in which direction is there a delay? Okay. All right, and so it's gonna be some combination of on and off, perhaps. All right. And check means that it's a delay in that direction. Well, actually, well, OK, we should just have nothing there. And D is don't know. That direction you mean? That, that there's a, this, is, this means that there's a sign. That, that's right. So this would be going from off to on. So turning on, so this is turning, turning on as compared to turning off. And we're looking at. Um, this is delay. If we're, we're talking about this is in response to S, Sx changing concentration of Z. Okay. All right. Any any questions about what I what I'm referring to in this? Is there any SI? Yes. Good question. I like that. All right. Si is present. Mm. Right, so this is compared to simple regulation. Or i.e., does the concentration of Z immediately start to change after uh, this SX changes? It goes from either 0 to 1 or 1 to 0. So simple regulation in this case would be erase that line between X and Y? Yes. Yeah. And make the AND gate a? Not an AND gate. N not, not an AND gate, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Right. And, you know, we're comparing to just if x is just directly regulating z. Because oh, okay. right. what we want to know is, right, I mean, what, what might a function of the feed forward loop be? Yeah. Okay. All right, so I'll give you 15 seconds to think through this. Once again, it's not that you should have memorized it. No, I don't want anybody saying that they just couldn't read my handwriting. All right. Um, I'm sorry. So this is, um, I'm asking about, the f for this feed forward loop, the coherent type 1 with an AND gate. And I'm comparing, I'm, say, you know, I'm asking, is there a delay, you know, either turning on or turning off, all right, um, as compared to the, uh, the simple regulation of x regulating z. And of course, the, this is, might be a sum of sx. <coughs> And we assume that x is already present, right? All right. All right, do you need more time? All right, ready? Three, two, one. OK, we got a clear majority of the group actually is saying C. OK, all right, and I, I so I, all right, I can, and we can, we can get at this kind of visually, graphically. You know, I, I really like graphs. I think they're much nicer than equations. 
Um, you know, different people can agree or disagree, but uh, but you know that's my. Right. The idea is that we have S X starts out off and say turns on. Okay. So if we think about the X star, all right, X was always around, so so that means the X star immediately. You know, so the signal immediately changes X into X star, the active version. Right. Now, y, and this is why we can even say y star, because the signal y is always there. All right, it starts out here. It immediately gets the signal, so it starts coming up. Okay. But of course, this is an AND gate, which means that you need to have both active y and active x in order to start getting expression of z. All right, so we have, if we look at z, It, there's some threshold at which y starts act allowing for expression of z. So just because we have active x doesn't mean that we immediately start getting expression of z. We need, we need y as well. So this comes up. All right. However, when the signal here comes, goes away, x star immediately goes away. This is the separation of time scale idea. All right. This is just a binding of a small molecule or so. All right, what that means is that, OK, y star, is there a delay on y star? All right, we're going to do a verbal. Is there a delay before y star just starts coming down? It's, you know, OK, so it, the question, it's going to decay exponentially once it starts going. Does it start going immediately, or does it, is there a delay? Right? So the question is, is there a delay before the exponential fall off of y star? You're going to say yes or no. Ready? Three, two, one. No delay. Great. Okay. And indeed, over here, it's the same thing. No delay because of the AND gate. Right? Expression of z requires both x star and y star. So although y star is still there, since it's an AND gate, z goes down. Okay. Right. That means that in this case, we have a sign sensitive delay for turning on z, but not for turning off z. Right, and of course, this can be useful depending upon the costs and benefits of having uh, false positives and false negatives in the signal. Right? Okay. So if, there, if, if this AND gate were switched to an OR gate, how does this thing change? All right, I'm going to give you 10 seconds. All right. So the question is, if I convert this to an OR gate, does it change anything or not? <laughs> okay. Do you need more time? Right. Ready. Three, two, one. Now we got a lot of Bs. Great. So, all right, so in this case, it's coherent type 1 feed forward loop with, uh, with an OR gate. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to go over the logic, but I encourage you to, uh, if, if you're confused by this, just make sure that you can reconstruct the argument. Okay? Um, from my standpoint, you know, these equations, I mean, you should be, it's good to do equations, but um, it's more important to be able to understand the logic here. Did you have a question? Yeah, or? so how is it easy to approach experimentally what kind of gate? Yes, yeah, so actually, yeah. So the idea is that um, in many cases you can put x on an inducible promoter, you can put y on an inducible promoter. So you can just some small molecule will allow you to control these, right? And then and then you can measure, say, fluorescence on on z, uh, and that, that's the most direct thing. It's experimentally doing it yourself. Of course, much of the data that you see in the chapter is is kind of just looking at the fluorescent z as a function of the um, the signals that you put in, and that that can that's certainly an argument. For it, and then ultimately, what you'd like is to to measure things in multiple different ways, confirm that it's all consistent. Yeah. Um, all right. All right. Any other questions about the, this idea of sen sign sensitive delay element? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, so along these forty-two. Uh, sorry. Yes. Now that's a good question. 
Um, right, so, so if you look at uh, across both E. coli and yeast, what you see is that of the feed-forward loops, um, about half of them are coherent type 1, right? Uh, which is one of the eight possible kinds of feed-forward loops, right? Um, right? And so what you're asking is, in this case, so let's say there are 20 coherent type 1. How many, of, what fraction of them does this all make sense? Uh, and, and it's a good question. I, I don't know. I haven't, yeah, I haven't, I haven't looked at it. Because you know, I mean, it, it's always dangerous, of course, that we find one example of the 20 where it, ex it, it kind of makes sense conceptually. And then we go and we test it experimentally and see that it all works. And then, um, and then we're convinced, right? But, the, but you're pointing out that maybe, maybe we shouldn't be convinced yet. Uh, so, but I'm just yeah. curious yeah. if you're uh, proposing a functional kind of explanation yeah. and if you know what the genes are. That, that's right. You should be able to go and see whether <laughs> it, it somehow makes sense. And then, of course, in all, you know, makes sense is always a slippery concept, right? Because you know, we can always, it's not that this radically changes the logic. Right, you know, and then you know, and then in any given circumstance, you can maybe say, "Oh well," you can kind of wave your arms and 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 make up a story where it kind of makes sense, you know. But then, um, the only way to really feel comfortable with it or not is for you yourself to go and look at them and see how comfortable you are with each of those arguments, right? Um, and you know, I haven't actually done that. No. Okay. All right, so one more one more question in, in this regard. All right, so let's imagine that. Instead of thinking about changes in Sx with Sy present, let's now flip things. Let's assume that Sx is present and ask about Sy turning on and off. Okay. Again, with the AND gate, I want to know in which direction is there a delay when turning either on or off. Now we're talking about with Sy turning on or off. All right. Does everybody understand the question? All right. I'll give you 10 seconds to make sure. All right, do you need more time? <coughs> Let's go ahead and vote. Ready? Three, two, one. All right. OK, so I'd say now it's, it's pretty overwhelming that the group again agrees that now it'll be A. All right, so if, if, if we have Sx equal to 1 and Sy changing, then in that, this case, we don't get any of these delays. All right, so there's sort of immediate changes in Z as Sy changes. And that's, and that's because this is, well, this is an AND gate. If x is already there, that means that we've already satisfi satisfied this half of it. Right, so then we're just reduced to simple regulation. This is just equivalent to y regulating z. So there are no delays either turning on or turning off. Okay. All right, so what you, what you read about from Uri's book is that the coherent type 1 uh, is perhaps the most common of the feed-forward loops observed in these transcription networks. Uh, the other uh, of the feed-forward loops that is distinctly overrepresented is this incoherent type 1. All right, so it's very similar with the exception that now what we have is x activating y. But now y is going to be repressing z. and we have x again activating z. Uh, and all right, then we're going to use an AND gate again. Okay. And it's edge. Uh, going to z. All right. Uh, for me, I find it sometimes a little bit confusing to think about a repression and an AND gate. So it is useful to make sure that we kind of understand the, the logic of all these things. Okay, so if we have, say, x star, y star, and we can just make sure okay, this is absence or presence. 
all right, digital approximation of each of these things. And the, and the question is uh, if we have um, expression of, um, of z. Okay. Now, the way to just think about this is that this, this guy is equivalent to kind of inverting the, um, the sign of, of y star. Okay. And then we have an AND gate. So this is a 0, 1. That's not an AND. We have, a, well, 0 is enough to give us a 0, 1, 1. Okay, so here we get activation. Here, here we don't. Okay. All right, and so we can, we can do a similar kind of story of what we did here, except that now, instead of y being an activator, it's now a, um, a, a repressor. And again, we're going to ha think about what happens with the signal coming in. All right. Is, th is there any difference up to, up to this point? Let's think about it. All right, everybody think about this for a second. All right, so this is a case where we already have signal y right, that's allowing, say, the y repressor to bind. But then we make sx appear. I want to know verbally, yes or no, is there a, is, do, do I have to do any, do I have to draw something new up to this point here? Ready, great. So okay, what do I want to say? Yeah. Is there a change? from this drawing up to this point. Ready? Three, two, one. Yes. yes. All right. And that's because actually z starts coming up at this point. All right. It's very, very nerve wracking, these, these, these quizzes, I know. Um, <laughs> right. And, and, and but this is a little bit, you know, the idea is that here y is now a repressor. So it's not that you need y in order to get expression of z. Is that once you have y star, then you stop getting expression of z. Right, so it, it looks like um, maybe I'll make it all right. So in this case, every, everything's the same here, except that it's it's in this case you start getting z coming up, right? But then once y gets up to a sufficiently high level, it starts repressing. Okay, and in that case, it might do something like this. Now, depending upon the strength of that repression, these, this curve might look different, right? Because it could come all the way down to zero, depending on if it's a, if it's a very effective repressor. Okay. So, and depending upon whether it's fully repressed or only partially repressed, you might think about it as either being a pulse generator, right? So you get some z and then it goes away. Okay. Or you could think about it as a way of increasing um, the rate at which you're able to turn this gene on. Right? Because it's sort of like this negative autoregulation idea that initially you get lots of expression and then later you stop getting as much. Of course, here you would get an overshoot, but you know, maybe that's not all bad. Right? Um, right, so in this, what, what we, you might say is that this is a pulse generator. And this here is uh, a way of making T on go down. Are there any questions about the logic of what, the, uh, what happens in this incoherent type 1? Yes? Can you explain the Xiong? Sure. Um, so let me, let's zoom in. All right. Um, and, and we can look at z. So it kind of gets expressed, and then it represses like this. Okay. And then you always have to ask, well, what do you mean by t on? And, and we have this working definition which is that we say, all right, well, t on is defined as there's some equilibrium concentration. right? So this is z uh, equilibrium. And we often define t on as the time in which you get half of that, half of that uh, concentration. Right? So what we do is we say we take half of that, and we, uh, we say, oh, OK, where does this cross? It crosses right here. OK, oh, I, I maybe overdid my drawing. It's too good of a, OK, so t on in this case would be that time right there. Okay. 
Now, of course, you have to say, well, what, what should we compare that to? And the comparison should be the, the t-on that you would have had with just simple regulation. right? So that's based on the, the generation time. And you can actually see what the generation time is here, because this thing, this thing in the absence of the repression would have done something like that. right? So this tells us that the simple regulation would have led to something that looks like this. Right? So you see that t on here, uh, this is t on uh, simple, is, is much larger than the t on that you actually get here. All right, so from this argument, there are we can now try to re recapitulate or recall for ourselves uh, the various strategies for uh, increasing the uh, rate of response to, to signals. Right. All right, so we have uh, we we can think about all right. There's some t you want to decrease t on and you want to decrease t off. Right. And we want to think about maybe different strategies that we've we've encountered over the last few weeks. What are what what are some of the what, what were some of the strategies? Yes. All right, higher degradation, right? Um, so increase degradation. De yeah. Well, or maybe I'll just say decrease lifetime. Well, all right. Well, you know, it's the same thing, right? So decrease the protein lifetime. And what, and what does that do for us? Does that uh, decrease T on, or does it decrease T off? Both, all right? So this, this decreases T, T on, and it decreases T off. What, are the, what were some of the other strategies? Yes? Negative autoregulation. Great. And what does that do for us? Um, all right. So let's 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 do a vote. Right, this is a good opportunity. I, this is like review for exams for you guys right now. All right. So negative autoregulation. Does it decrease T on? T off, both, neither, something or another. All right, eight seconds. Okay. Ready, three, two, one. All right, so we got um, many Cs, but many other things as well. All right, but yeah, indeed, um, it, it's only going to decrease T on, actually. And that's because, remember, the negative autoregulation, what it does is it initially it makes a lot of this protein. But then once you hit the repression threshold, then it sort of represses itself. And so you, you, you are able to kind of rapidly get up to that level, and then you, you clamp it there. Whereas turning off, that just means that you just tell it to stop making it. Right? So it's always going to then decay at um, the rate that is dictated by its effective lifetime, which is kind of either from the protein uh, or from, from the actual degradation or from the, the growth of the cell. Right, so it's, this only decreases T on. And then indeed, we just learned about another one here, which was the incoherent, incoherent type 1 feed forward loop with kind of modest amounts of repression, right? Uh, incomplete repression or so. And, and what does that do here? Oh, did we actually even figure out what it did here? Oh, we maybe didn't say. All right, five seconds again over here. All right, what does it, does it, we've, we've, well, I told you one half of it already, but what is the other half? All right. You can. All right, ready. Incoherent type 1 feed forward loop. What does it do? Ready? 3, 2, 1. OK, we got, a, again, a bunch of Cs. All right. Um, in, indeed, this is 
Um, and of course, I'm using the same chart for the sign sensitive delay and for the um, time to turn on and turn off. So I hope that that doesn't confuse you. If it does, I'm sorry. All right, so this is, this is it decreases T on but not T off. Right? This is an AND gate, so you need both active X star and Y star. Right? So the moment that you uh, make uh, SX go away, then it's going to start. Uh, oh, wait, no, I'm explaining a different one. OK, sorry, sorry. This is the time. OK, so we're at Z. OK, but yeah. It immediately starts going down, but at the same normal rate of effective lifetime, right? Many more ways to make, uh, to make a protein quickly than to get rid of it quickly. Right. Right. Are there any questions about what we've said here? So while we're on the topic of uh, kind of response times and, and so forth, uh, it's, it's, it's important to remember that the characteristic time for all these things is kind of the generation time or the protein lifetime. Right? So these are, th these are ways of processing information over time scales that are kind of like minutes, maybe even tens of minutes, maybe hours. Right? So it's rather slow. Okay. Now, is, is that in general going to be good enough for all, everything that a cell needs to do? No. Okay. So it's important to highlight the, that you know, transcription is slow. So that means that transcription networks are going to be slow. Right? Uh, and that's both because you actually have to do transcription and translation and so forth, but also you just have to change the concentrations of proteins. Okay. Right, so if, if you need to uh, kind of respond to things more rapidly, then what is it, what is it that you need to do? Phosphorylation. Phosphor, yeah. It's, it's all about phosphorylation, yes. Uh, uh, indeed, phosphorylation. Right, so you need. If you want to be fast, you have to. You can't have. Um, you can't be changing overall protein concentrations. You have to change protein state, right? And, and phosphorylation is, is kind of the classic way of doing that, right? So uh, I just want to highlight that, you know, you know, for speed, uh, you need uh, just to to do kind of protein uh, protein networks, all right? So we're not actually going to be reading uh, the chapter uh, analyzing kind of these map kinase cascades and so forth. Uh, but, uh, but if you're interested in such things, I very much encourage you to do so. It's uh, also nice chapters. Uh, maybe not as nice as the, first, as the first four, which is part of why we're not reading them. But, um, but it's, it's a very important insight in the sense that we've spent a lot of time talking about transcription networks just because uh, there's a lot of, I think, simple, beautiful things that you can say about them. Uh, Whereas uh, they are intrinsically limited in terms of speed. Okay, so for, uh, for much of what a cell needs to do, it has to already have the proteins there. And then, uh, and then, and then you can take advantage of these, these rapid processes. Right? So we talk about SX rapidly binding change in the state of X. Okay? From the standpoint of transcription networks, we just draw this as a straight line. You know, right? It's rapid. But what that's saying is that if you just change states of proteins, then you can, do, uh, you can do a lot of information processing rather rapidly. Right? And you don't have to do, do just a simple thing of, of SX binding X. You can also have uh, proteins regulating each other and, then, and, and performing logic functions at the protein uh, only level. Okay. Um, all right. What I want to do for the last uh, 20 minutes is, is say, uh, say something about temporal programs that can be implemented with sort of larger uh, network motifs. And in particular, this is material basically from chapter five of, uh, uh, of the book, which again, we're not going to be reading. It's, uh, I think it's, again, it's beautiful, but it's, it's really simple. So I think that in, in 20 minutes, we can, we can cover it just fine. All right. All right. So for many cases, for example, in the context of um, metabolic pathways, right? It might be the case that you have you know, some protein, well, all right. we'll call them Zs. All right, some, you'll have some protein Z1 that, um, that does something, right? So that catalyzes um, some, all right, so we might have some you know, molecule 1 that's converted into molecule 2 by Z1, converted into molecule 
3 phi z z2. All right. Um, and all right. All right. So many metabolic pathways have this structure where uh, there are a series of enzymes that are doing something to the product of the previous enzyme. Okay. Now, the question is, let's say that this is uh, some carbon source that we didn't have before, but uh, now uh, it's appeared in our environment. Okay. So what we would like is we'd like to start digesting uh, that carbon source. Or uh, in the flip side, maybe we have to make some complex uh, molecule or uh, an amino acid or so. And so then what we're doing is we're building something up coming down. Right? Now, uh, in either case, if, you were to, if before you weren't making these Z proteins, but now you want them, the right, question is, uh, maybe you could just make them all at the same time. But maybe it would be better to make some of them first and some of them later. What do you think? All right. Um, and it, you know, let's say, for the sake of argument, that you would want to have some first and some later. Which ones would you want first? Yeah, the ones you need first, right? So you'd maybe want to first have Z1, then Z2, then Z2. All right. Um, you know, it's, it's a kind of a, it's a trivial statement, but you know, you might not actually think about it, right? Uh, and the question is, how might we be able to do this? <coughs> okay. Well, uh, there's a very simple thing called the single input module, right? The idea here is there's some uh, transcription factor X, which actually does this fabulous thing where it creates all these guys. All right. Interestingly, this also often has autoregulation right, um, in order to, um, for example, stabilize the concentration of it. Okay? But this single input module, the reason it's called a, si a single input module is because uh, the, the network motif is saying not just that x makes many z's. Right? That actually you can't, you can't actually argue that that's a, a network motif from the standpoint of, of a degree preserving network, because of course, this is just saying, well, some nodes you know, activate many other nodes. Right? And in a degree preserving network, that's always still going to be true. right? But you can say that such a thing is a network motif when you say that these z's are only regulated by x. Right? So that happens somehow more frequently than what you would expect. Um, although now that I just said that, I'm a little bit worried that even the degree preserving would, um, I think you have to be a little more subtle in defining uh, your null model in that case. All right, but I'll just say that this happens more frequently than you might expect, which is that you have one transcription factor, uh, say, activating many, um, many different proteins. And this makes sense, right? Because if all these Zs are involved in the same metabolic program, then when you want Z1, you also want Z2, and you also want Z3. Right, so this makes a lot of sense. Okay? But what is, uh, not, what is a little bit less obvious, perhaps, is that it's possible to do this such that, uh, such that you first make one, and then you make the other. Right? And the way that, that you can do this is just by you have different activation kind of thresholds, k1, k2, et cetera, up to kn for each of these. Right? So then if x is turned on, right? So let's say that you first see something. All right, so this, you actually have to have x start at 0 and then grow over time. Okay, but then if you just have different thresholds, right? Now the question is, where should I draw k1 and where should I draw? All right, do I draw k1 the low position or the high position? Low. Perfect. All right, so we say k1, here's k2. Here's k, uh, n, and then there might be some others in between. Right? So the idea is that x grows over time. And you first kind of activate expression of gene 1, and then gene 2, and so forth. And then the proteins will kind of naturally appear in the proper order. And there's actually beautiful data in chapter 5 uh, illustrating this in the context of uh, arginine biosynthesis. Okay. Um, all right, so it's, um, it's, quite, it's quite neat to see that. The, it's not just, you know, I, of course, it's easy to kind of think up this idea and say, oh, yeah, maybe the cell might want to do this, right? But then 
it's quite cool and you see that actually in some cases the cell actually really does do this. Right? And you can actually see that they're expressed sequ sequentially in the same order as they appear in the, in the biosynth biosynthetic pathway. All right, so this is uh, this kind of gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling inside, right? All right, I'm not going to make you vote on whether you have a warm, fuzzy feeling, but um, <laughs> yeah. Could you also have you know, this some sort of red line uh, required for transcription? Ah, yes. So you right. So you you could you could have a cascade in that way, um, and that's that's a really good question. That would work, but um, but there's a problem, which is that it's super slow, right? Because the, there's a characteristic time scale for each of these things, which is this cell generation time. And here, when, when I say you want it a little bit after, the, you want it after the other, what I'm, what I'm saying is you might want it a few minutes after, right? I mean, you know. Um, and it, so in the context of development, in some cases, the, some things that really are very slow, then that is actually what happens. So there's a long cascade of you know, one activating, two activating. You know. But in the context of, of this, yeah, you, you really want something that's just delayed by five minutes each, or maybe even just a couple minutes each. Right, and in that case, because um, really the, the range over which you can have this sort of delay like this, from the beginning to the end, I mean, this is still you know it might be you know one to two say cell generations slash lifetimes, right? Right, so you you just can't get much more of a dynamic range. Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble because you can't have this be too close to the top. Otherwise, if you're a little bit off, you you're, you know you know so it really maybe we should even just say one generation. Right. So that's kind of how, uh, how much of a delay you might reasonably be able to get from this mechanism. Or the, and, and, in, indeed, and that's as much as you would want for some, something like this. Okay. So this is, uh, this is great. Uh, I think you know, when, you know, when, I, you know, when I first read this, I was like, oh, you know, I, I was feeling it. Okay. Now the question is, after this um, carbon source or the need to make arginine or whatnot, after it goes away, then we'll stop making these, uh, making these proteins. And the question is, is this what we call a FIFO Q or a LIFO Q? Li li LIFO? LIFO? It's been a long time. You, you, a lot, I have a lot of faces that are like, what are you talking about? OK. Um, right, so um, this is a first, first in, first out. Have you guys really not, you, you never took any of these computer science classes where they talk about this? All right, and this is a last in, first out. All right, so um, just to be clear about what this means, so at the, at the grocery store, all right, is that a first in, first out, or a last in, first out? So first in, first out, right? If you get in line first, you get out first, hopefully, OK? And when that doesn't happen, you get very annoyed and so forth, right? But last in, first out, this is, for example, what happens in your inbox. Okay? Right? So you have a stack of paper. People are giving you things you're supposed to like, sign or fill out. You know, and the pile kind of comes up. And then you, know, you handle things on top of the pile first. Right? So the things that get stuck at the bottom, like, you never get to them. Right? And that's because that's a last in, first out queue. All right? And you know, so different. Um, Depending on well, and in computer science, I mean, you, they can choose these things, and it's relevant, and so forth, right? Uh, but man, there are many situations where this, this sort of idea appears, right? And so the question is, in the single input module, do we have a first in, first out, or a last in, first out queue? All right, I'll give you 15 seconds to think about this. Yeah, question. All right, so oh, so in and out. What I mean is that. Um, the concentration of each of these Zs, you know, these guys, they they uh, they were produced in different in some order, right? So first so they, we pr started producing Z1, then Z2s, and then and so forth up to Zn, right? And what I want to know is, what order will they, the concentration kind of go away in? Right? And and you know you might want to <coughs> look at this figure because it's going to be it's going to be super useful. All right, any other questions about what I'm? All right, so in and out refers to concentrations going up and then going down. All right, let's go ahead and vote. Ready? Three, two, one. See, I mean, people learned what a FIFO and LIFO cues were, and then, um, and and now, already we can use it. Okay, so this is a last in, first out cue, right? And 
in general, which kind of queue do we like? We like LIFO queues more, right? Um, well, OK, you can argue. But um, in this situation, would we like a FIFO or a LIFO queue? We're going to, you know, I'll give you 10 seconds. All right. In a biosynthetic pathway, would you want a LIFO or a FIFO queue? Yeah, and if, and if you're totally confused by everything I'm saying, you can do the flash all the letters, numbers, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, all right, ready? Three, two, one. All right, so there's some disagreement. OK, we got, uh, but uh, now a majority of people are saying that uh, although the single input module gives us a live OQ, what we might really like is a FIFO OQ. And, why, and can somebody say why that would be? Right, we don't want like to pile up those intermediates, right? So just for the same reason that we wanted to start with Z1 and then get Z2 and so forth, right? And the reason that was because there's no point in having Z2 until after we have Z1, right? Because there's nothing for Z2 to do. It'd be wasted energy to make it. In the same way, when it, when we're getting rid of these proteins, we would actually like to get rid of them first, this one, and then later. Why? Right. 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 OK, well, yeah, carbon source showing up again, that's, I think that's a separate argument. Yeah, yeah so the reason that we, right, the, the statement is really just that if we first get rid of Zn, then we are just going to pile up molecule n minus 1. Right? That's right. That's right. So you can just think about like, the flow of those, uh, of the, metabolites of the molecules in there. And you, you kind of want to first get rid of this, so then we stop making this, and then we go, kind of travel on down. Okay? So there are many con, uh, contexts in which you would perhaps really like to have um, a, a FIFO queue. And indeed, one of the things that, uh, that had been studied uh, previously was the flagellar biosynthesis pathway. So uh, E. coli and many other bacteria, they make these flagella that allows them to swim. Right, we're going to talk a lot about that in coming weeks. But in this context, uh, what, it had been, what had been found, actually, is that it is indeed a FIFO cube. Right? So when they first start to make these flagella, they, uh, they make, and it's a, this is a big, complicated machine, right? but they, they make it in the order that it appear, that it's transported and put in the membrane. Okay? But then when it is taken away, when you stop making the flagellar components, then it's, again, in the same order as, um, as they were made in, which kind of makes sense. Now, uh, the question is, how might we be able to do that? Now in the, um, I think, all right, so let me explain it. And the basic answer is via an extension of these feed forward loops. So it's what we call a multi-output feed forward loop. What we have here is we have some x, and it is going to uh, come to y. And then y, again, is going to do this thing to z1 and z2 and all the others. Okay. But it's a feed forward loop because we also have x coming in here as so. Uh, and I think that we do want to have these be AND gates. Let me just make sure I'm not. Uh, no, here it's, here it's an OR gate. Okay. Um. All right, so we're, we're going to assume that all of these uh, inputs are, are combined via an OR gate. All right, and what we have is we have some K1, K2, et cetera, up to Kn. But then we have another set of k's, which are k1 primes, k2 prime, kn prime. Okay? So we have a set of k's corresponding to how x interacts with the promoter at the z. We have a different set of k primes that tells us how y interacts with the promoter at z. Okay? And the question is, how can we get a FIFO order?
right, I'm going to illustrate some options, and you can think about it while I do it. Those are these are dissociation constants. So these are again, this is where this is can be thought of as the concentration of the active protein in which it starts being effective in sending a signal to Z. Question. Would, would you not want to integrate? I hope not, because otherwise I'm going to be in trouble. Uh, uh, why don't we, maybe for now, let's assume that I'm, I, I've written the right thing and then uh, we'll find out, <laughs> we'll find out soon enough. If, uh, <laughs> All right, does everybody understand the question here? All right, I'll just give you another 15 seconds to think about it. All right, do you need more time? Or just a little bit more, and then. All right, let's go ahead and give it a go. Ready? Three, two, one. OK. All right, so we got um, a majority B, but some Cs. OK. Um, all right, so let's try, let's try to figure this out. OK. So what we assume is that x comes and it's going to do this, and then it's going to do this. right? And we can just have two values for now, k1 and k2. right? Um, so this is x. Now we're going to have y. And we, we can talk about, and this is also x star y. You know, we'll assume that we always have these things. So y is also going to come. It'll be activated here uh, at some time, which we don't. It's going to be delayed by a little bit, right? Maybe. OK. OK. So that's what y is going to do. Now we want, we want to know about uh, Z1 and Z2, right? Well, the idea here is that it's going to be the, K, the regular K1 and K2 that determine the order that it appears. right? We have an OR gate. Y is going to be delayed. So it's really the important thing is what the, um, is what the normal Ks do in terms of turning on Zs. Yes? Um, and this is especially true because y is, again, delayed because it has its own threshold for turning on, right? So since y is delayed, it won't really have a chance to influence the behavior of the x's, right? Oh, and I, actually, I should have drawn this delayed, too, as well, right? Yeah. Okay. So it's the order of the k's that determine 
how z is turned on, but it's the order of the k primes that, are, that tell us how the z's uh, are turned off. Right? And that's, again, because y is delayed relative to x. And we have an OR gate. Okay. So if, indeed, in this case, if we have it like this, then we want things to be in the opposite order with respect to y. So if we wanted k1 to be less than k2, then we actually want, you know, say, kn to be, I'm sorry, and we want k1 here, and then we want kn down below. Okay. And, and the heart of this is really because of the fact that x is also regulating y with some, some other constant, ky. Right. And this is going to tell us how much y is delayed relative to x. But the heart of this is that since y is delayed, it's really the dynamics of x at the beginning that tell us how the z's are turned on. But it's the dynamics of, or it's the dynamic of the y and the k primes, k1 prime, kn prime, that tell us the order at which those, uh, those z's are going to be turned off. Right? So with the proper choice of, of orderings of k's and k primes, you can then get um, you can then get a, a FIFO cube. Okay. All right, with that, I think we should quit. Uh, please read the uh, Sunny She's paper very carefully, because it's going to be uh, focused on a lot over the next lecture. All right, have a good weekend.